This is the five minute guide to the courageous class battle cruisers of the Royal Navy. Okay, so these aren't the strangest ships to ever be built. The French won that award even before the dreadnought hit the water, but they're surely up there in the top ten. In an era where everyone, including the rest of the British fleet, was thinking of battle cruisers as ships armed with eight or nine 15 inch guns or above, battleship grade armour, etc., etc., along comes something half the displacement, half the armament, and a quarter of the armour. Oh, and it's officially a large light cruiser, which is about as honest as this through deck cruiser or this destroyer. Perhaps it would be a good idea to reflect on why these things were built in the first place. You see, the first sea lord at the time was Admiral Fisher, the man who had introduced both the dreadnought battleship and the battlecruiser to the world. And he had a plan, the so-called Baltic Project, to try and shorten the First World War. You see, in the east of the German Empire was Pomerania. It was less than 100 miles from Berlin and had nice flat beaches and no defences. Why no defences? Well, the Russian Baltic fleet wasn't a threat to the larger high seas fleet in offensive actions, and anyone else would have to come through the narrow and shallow waters between Denmark and Sweden, which meant larger, slower and more heavily armoured ships would have problems, whilst Germany's Kiel Canal allowed them to move full-size capital ships back and forth easily. So Fischer's idea was to send a seaborne army through the narrows, land on the beaches and capture Berlin to end the war, to repel surprise German cruisers and provide fire support, a far ship with a shallow draft was needed. An improved version of the renowned class battle cruisers was suggested, but there was a restriction on building anything larger than a light cruiser in 1915. So instead, the ships were given the armour and speed of a light cruiser, the armament of half a battleship, and the size and displacement of a battle cruiser, and labelled large light cruisers. Someone, somehow, bought this cover story. The ships would be capable of 32 knots, with 3 inches of armour, count them, and a main battery of two twin 15-inch guns, one at each end, six triple 4-inch guns, and a pair of anti-aircraft guns, and two single torpedo tubes, because when you're charging around in an oversized tin can, getting in close enough to torpedo an enemy is clearly high on the list of priorities. And to cap it all off, this bizarre armament clearly wasn't enough, so whilst the first two ships, the Courageous and Glorious, were built to this specification, the last ship, Furious, was designed with a new main armament. Two single 18-inch guns replacing the twin 15-inch turrets, although in the event only the rear gun was ever fitted. All three ships were laid down in 1916 and launched the next year. Their utterly nonsensical nature continued in service, being so lightly built the Courageous sustained significant structural damage in a storm and needed repairs and stiffening. She was then fitted as a mine layer, of all things, only to never be given any actual mines. And then in 1917, both Courageous and Glorious were given a half dozen twin torpedo launchers for a total of 14 torpedo tubes scattered around this gigantic ship. Why? What exactly were they planning? Furious got even weirder, if you can believe that. Halfway through building, once the rear gun was installed, someone decided to put a 10 aircraft hangar and a flight deck on the front. Now look at the picture, can you spot the slight issue you might have landing on this thing? Apparently you were supposed to go around the superstructure and slip sideways for your final approach. After testing showed that this was shockingly not the most ideal way of landing an aircraft, the rear gun was removed, incidentally ending her career as the most heavily armed aircraft carrier in existence and a second flight deck was built at the back, with the funnel and superstructure poking out of the middle. This was phenomenally even less successful, thanks to all the turbulence and the hot burning gases uh, exiting out the back of the funnel, and after three attempts, the use of the rear flight deck as anything other than a tennis court and giant sunbathing strip were forbidden, except for the odd airship. The two slightly less insane ships did actually get to fight in the Second Battle of Heligoland Bight. Here, a force of German cruisers, destroyers and other small ships found themselves being run down by British cruisers, the battle cruiser Repulse, and the Courageous and Glorious. The two large light cruisers opened an intense barrage and mainly managed to hurt themselves. The left-hand gun in Glorious's forward turret had a shell go off inside it, and repairs were needed to fix damage to both ships from their own muzzle blast. They managed a single 15-inch shell hit on a German cruiser in exchange. Furious actually got to use its aircraft to attack a Zeppelin base with moderate success, and then all three ships turned up for the German surrender, no doubt to the great confusion of everybody else.
With the war over, the ships went into reserve pretty quickly, but with the Washington Naval Treaty curtailing the number of ships with battleship-sized guns, much like the Americans with the Lexingtons and the Japanese with the Akagi, the British found they had some large, fast, lightly armoured ships they really didn't need anymore, and the first flash of useful inspiration in these ships' careers showed when all three were slated for immediate conversion into proper aircraft carriers. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below.